Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our third episode of Serverless Deep Dives. Today, we have uh, another packed schedule full of awesome speakers. Uh, I'm looking forward to the content today. It's it's looking like we're going to have like a good overview of serverless and then jump into serverless data. So we're looking at a pretty good schedule. Um, today, we have two guests with us. We have Mahmoud from Neon, and we have Rob Reed from CockroachDB, and I'll introduce them more as we uh, bring them on. Uh, but before I do, I want to quickly call out that we have um, officially this last week, we uh, have announced our, di our official Discord server. I'm going to post the link in the chat here. Uh, so if you have wanted a Prisma Discord server, which I know a lot of you have, we've gotten a lot of requests for this and a lot of angry comments about it. Uh, here is the link to it there. Feel free to join it. Um, we're going to be announcing this event on that Discord server mostly uh, in the future, so uh, you can keep updated there. Uh, I also see a bunch of Cockroach DB people coming in the chat, so uh, hey guys, awesome to see you coming to support. Um, to start off the stream, I'm going to bring up my friend Mahmood, and we're going to get this thing going. So let's have him come up. Hey, hey, hey. hey how are you doing today? Good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Just awesome. uh, super excited to be here. Yeah. And yeah, I've watched the previous episodes. They've been really, really interesting. And yeah. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, it's 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 been a fun event series so far. Uh, I'm looking forward to see where it goes. Um, excited for today. Um, but why don't you just to start off, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're working right now and sort of like your experience, how you got into serverless and all that. Oh, man. Sure. So uh, I'm a mood. I work as a developer, uh, uh, as developer advocate at Neon. Uh, we do serverless Postgres. Um, my talk today is not going to be about Neon, but a lot of the concepts I'll talk about today are very relevant. Um, yeah, I love to, I don't know, like I love hanging out in developer communities, creating content, uh, doing these sort of events, hanging out um, with developers and chatting with them. So yeah. I got into serverless a couple of years back, and it was actually kind of my way of getting into backend development. Like I started out as a front-end engineer. Uh, I build UIs. I love to do it. Still do it till this day. Uh, but I was like, OK, I want to actually build business logic and functionality. Mm. And serverless kind of was my way of getting into all of that. And then I was able to just learn about the entire ecosystem, the different trade-offs between different solutions. But yeah, pretty sure my first was probably Nellify serverless functions, okay. I believe. Um, or it could be like something uh, on Vercel, maybe. But then I played around with like a bunch of other tools. But yeah, it's honestly super exciting, kind of like technology. And my talk today is really just supposed to, I don't know, try to make sense of the term serverless that gets used kind of like quite frequently by a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of give people, yeah, like the foundation of what it is like my talk title is a gentle introduction to serverless it will be a gentle introduction <laughs> um but yeah yeah no that's great because uh like you said a lot of people use the term serverless and a lot of people don't use it right so uh it'll be good to sort of like set that foundation yeah absolutely good yeah awesome well uh that's great uh thanks for coming on with us and i think i'm gonna transition over and um we can get this thing going sure Oh, wow. Fancy transition. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to this talk, A Gentle Introduction to Serverless. Um, the goal of this talk really, like I said, is just to lay the foundation, explain kind of like what serverless means, uh, because the term is a little bit overloaded, um, as kind of like you'll see why. Yes, questions are very, very welcome. Uh, this is like, think of this as uh, interactive. Like I can see the questions coming in. So feel free to ask any questions. So first things first, for me, who this talk is for. So it's really about anyone who's interested in the serverless space who wants to learn about it. I think serverless kind of offers a great way for developers kind of like me who were like, you know, I used, like I said, I used to be a front developer and kind of like this serverless enabled me to do more and build kind of like full stack applications. Uh, or if you're a backend developer who's new to serverless, maybe you just, you know, like you use regular servers, 
um, and you're curious about this space and what the hype is all about. So yeah, a little bit about me. I kind of already did a mini intro, uh, but I'm Mahmoud. I work as a developer advocate at Neon. And yeah, I love building side projects. I just, yeah, I film videos, write blog posts, do these sort of live streams, and I love hanging out in developer communities. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. That's where I'm most active. Uh, feel free to ping me, send me DMs. Like, yeah, I'm always uh, happy to chat. So before kind of getting started, I really want to make sure that um, everyone is aware of the client-server model. So the client-server model, um, in simple terms, it's like you have several components that all interact with each other through a request and response cycle. So you have the client, and you can think of the client, well, you know, the browser could be like your phone, uh, like an app on your phone. And what happens is the client interacts with the server by sending it requests. Let's say you're um, like you want to fetch some data or update some data or delete some data, you'll be sending a request and then the server will respond. Now, typically you will want to have a database in your architecture because you want to persist data. But technically uh, you can just have a client and a server interacting with each other um, through our request and response cycle. Now, serverless really is about the server part. Like we're going to kind of zoom in a little bit here. Uh, to understand what it's all about. So the way I think about it is there are different ways for you to work with servers. And the different ways to work with servers usually fall kind of like on the spectrum, where on one end, you kind of do everything yourself. And on the other end, you just focus on code. So if you know, you're completely unfamiliar, unfamiliar with, let's say, managing everything yourself as a backend developer, well, this could be you actually managing a server yourself, installing the operating system, making sure that everything is installed properly, and you know, making sure that this server scales and handle like all sorts of requests and you're maintaining it. They're like you can actually do this and it it's a way to do things, and it works. Um, everything kind of has its own pros and cons, but this is one way of doing it. And you will find that there are different solutions that, again, they fit in different places on the spectrum. For example, I don't know, if you use something like Heroku, well, Heroku kind of sits in, I don't know, more towards managing things yourself a little bit. Uh, like you can have a long running server, you might need to monitor it, you might need to maybe like scale it yourself or introduce a layer where, you know, you're aware of how things work and either maybe like, you know, scaling like your servers vertically or scaling them horizontally. So in the case of like servers, let's say you have a server that is receiving a ton of traffic. There are two ways to manage this sort of scale. Either you upgrade to a more powerful server, this is scaling vertically, or you can distribute the workload across multiple servers. Each approach has its own pros and cons. You can, and like kind of like, there are different ways to do it. Some services make this process really easy. Um, other techniques, you have to kind of know what you're doing to be able to do this. So that's kind of really how I think about it. Um, and when you think about serverless, there are still servers. It's just, they're so abstracted away that you really only focus on your code. So serverless really fits on kind of like the extreme end. You don't really do anything other than, okay, I want to have some sort of logic and this logic is deployed and then everything else is taken care of. So for example, why would you choose something like serverless instead of managing things yourself? You can automatically scale up or down without really planning ahead. So if you have your own server, you might be like, okay, I want to choose the amount of resources that I want to allocate. I want to decide, okay, how much like memory and CPU I want to allocate for my server um, and just so that it can handle the workload. And do you want something that is super powerful? Would you do like, I don't know, like a load balancing strategy? Like there are a lot of things where you might need to do a lot of planning. And another reason that serverless kind of like is nice is, well, you only pay for what you use. So, in a serverless model, let's say a serverless compute, um, something like AWS Lambda versus all serverless functions, or uh, I don't know, Cloudflare workers, 
you're charged for your usage. And this usage is tracked based on, you know, let's say the number of requests you're sending uh, or the amount of time that your functions are running for. So this is very cool because typically serverless by nature, since it scales up and down, it can scale down to zero. So this means if you have a serverless function and you're not calling it, well, you're not really paying for anything. So that's kind of also nice compared to a traditional, let's say like, you know, server that you manage yourself is that typically you will have a server running 24 seven and regardless of your usage, while well, you're going to be paying like a fixed monthly fee uh, in the context of like, you know, let's say AWS Lambda, which is kind of like the opposite. Well, you only pay for what you use. So that's cool. Now, of course, you don't really manage infrastructure or maintain it yourself. You like, you know, if you go to any provider that enables you to deploy surplus functions, they just tell you, hey, point like give us your code. They might ask you to point it to like point the service to a GitHub repo. They take care of deploying it, making sure that everything runs and it automatically scales up or down. So it's very nice. Like you really don't have to worry about all of this. You can just write your logic in, you know, let's say small functions and it just works. And then finally, yeah, like simple deployment. Usually uh, when you use serverless, things just work, which is awesome. So yeah, that's kind of what serverless is all about. And I used like AWS Lambda as an example, um, but it's not really just about the compute part. Like serverless is about these kind of principles where you don't really have to worry about managing and scaling infrastructure things just work and you only pay for what you use. So when you have these elements, it is fair for you to say like, okay, this is kind of like serverless. Now there are situations where, I don't know, let's say a company is building a um, an API that handles something. Uh, I don't know, for example, AWS, um, if you like, they have a page dedicated uh, for listing the different services that they have that are serverless. And part of the services that are listed is SNS, which is simp which stands for Simple Notification Service. And I don't know, for me, like it's it's an API that you call and it handles everything. It's not um, it, like for me, this kind of where the term serverless is a little bit overused, or it's kind of like an umbrella term that includes many things, um, because you know the idea of it just works, and you don't have to worry about servers technically makes it serverless and you only pay for what you use. But I don't know, for me at least, I, I like to use the term serverless when there is like typically servers involved that you manage. And then like it's it's related to the code you write, but it kind of works. But I don't know, for me, it's just, it, it feels like it's a little bit of an overloaded term, but I think these are kind of like the principles. And yeah, finally, serverless is more than function as a service. Uh, so like the F is for function and then the rest is as a service because you can have serverless, like other serverless services. So you can have serverless databases uh, like Neon. Um, you can have also Neon is like serverless Postgres. There's also like CockroachDB. I believe they also have a serverless offering. There is uh, also like serverless Redis. There is serverless MySQL. Like, they're, like in databases, you can have serverless offering. There's like also this MongoDB. And all of these, again, they follow the same philosophy of you only pay for what you use, typically. And you can also have serverless containers. So the thing is, sometimes people think that, oh, like serverless, so you're talking about AWS Lambda or serverless functions. Serverless functions are typically suited for, um, you know, like they're not suited for long running kind of like uh, workloads. So let's say you have some sort of workload that requires a ton of time to execute. You can't really use AWS Lambda with it because um, like the serverless functions or AWS Lambda, they have uh, a maximum time limit when it comes to execution. Um, but there are serverless containers and these serverless containers, well, they allow you to handle uh, long running workloads. And I believe like an example is like what AWS Fargate, there's also fly.io, which enables you to achieve this sort of flow. Um, but yeah, then there's also like serverless queues and more. So that's 
kind of like what I want to make sure that everyone kind of understands is that at the end of the day, when you have the client server model, there is some sort of server. Now, how the server is configured, managed, there are different ways to do it. But typically when we talk about serverless, well, it's it's about the principles that I just shared, where you pay for what you use, you don't really think about infrastructure. There's a server. So it's like, you know, serverless is is a little bit of a misnomer and it, it can be a little bit misleading, but it's kind of what the industry um, is is using. So whenever someone is using it, most likely that's what, you, what, that's what they mean. So that's pretty much it. That's kind of what I wanted to um, cover and explain. And I want this talk to kind of be an opportunity for anyone to really ask questions that are related to this space where, I don't know, you might be curious about the edge and what it is, or maybe you're curious about, you know, what are the drawbacks of uh, serverless? Because right now I just talked about the benefits, but it's it's a bit more complicated than that. So yeah, I kind of wanted just for this part um, of the event to kind of just lay the grounds for it. And then for, you know, everyone else to kind of just chat and ask questions about it. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions, Definitely drop them in the chat. We'd love to answer them with uh, Sabin. And also, yeah, if you have anything, you can reach out to me on Twitter. So, yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mahmood. That, that was great. Um, I posted your, your Twitter link in the chat. So if anyone wants to go follow Mahmood. Nice. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Get, get some more of his knowledge. Uh, go follow him there. He posts great stuff. Um, and like you said, uh, we are hoping to have more like a community feel in this stream. So please uh, post your comments. We'll talk about them for sure as they get posted. We also have a panel at the end. So if you don't think of something right away, um, post it at any time throughout the stream. Um, and we'll be thinking about those questions. And then um, all of the speakers together can sort of, we'll put our minds together and figure out the answers to your questions. Uh, so yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, but thanks again, Mahmood. Um, I think I'm going to bring up Rob next. And um, we'll see you back at the panel. All right. See you soon. Cool. Hey, Rob. Hey, how are you doing? Thank you for I'm, having me. Yeah, of course. I'm doing I'm doing great today. And how are you? Very well, thank you. The weather is gray, which is as <laughs> as can be hoped from, from the UK. But uh, otherwise, absolutely good. Yep, it's awesome. been a very busy day. Lots of meetings. So if I'm yawning, it's not you. It's very much me. <laughs> got it. Got it. Very cool. Um, well, why don't we uh, why don't we start off this talk a little bit like we did with Mahmood? Why don't you just tell us a bit about yourself and your experience and sort of like what's gotten you into serverless and the whole space? Sure. So I started my career back in 2006, so about 17 years ago, and I was pretty heavy in the Microsoft stack. So basically the the antithesis of serverless back then. So it was very much WPF, um, IIS, if you remember that. What a what a piece of tech. <laughs> uh, WPF, WCF, those kind of things. And then I, I moved to more open source technologies. Go um, hosting or orchestrating on Kubernetes, deploying via Docker containers, etc. So I'd like to think I've, I've had a, a bit of exposure to a lot of things, perhaps deep exposure in some areas. Serverless isn't an area I would consider that I have deep exposure. So anyone on the call wanting to get a deep level of understanding from serverless from me, I'm not your person. But I will hope I'll try to do my best. Um, but it, what got me into serverless um, is a number of things, really. I haven't really, I wouldn't say I've used serverless in depth as a, as a really heavy consumer. But my first outing with, with serverless was probably maybe five, five six years ago um, with GCP. And then I tried um, AWS Lambda, as a lot of people do. But I think maybe interesting for this conversation, I haven't had any exposure to um, any other kind of serverless frameworks. So for example, um, Prisma DB proxy or Vercel serverless or things like that, Fly.io, as um, Mahmoud mentioned, I haven't had any exposure to those. So my exposure to, to what I consider to be serverless or what, how I've interacted with serverless is perhaps a little bit different, a bit gotcha. more like uh, pr probably a bit more headachey. <laughs> right, right, yeah, gotcha. <laughs> That's cool. I, I feel like uh, our story is sort of coming up in, in development are sort of similar where um, I kind of poked around with a bunch of different technologies, older ones and watched sort of as things evolved. 
I've jumped into serverless a little bit, um, but not super, super deep. And that's why I really love these, these sessions is that we can sort of put our minds together and figure, uh, figure some of these things out and just share knowledge. Absolutely. I'll be learning from this event. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> nice. Um, well, so you work at CockroachDB right now, and your, your main offering is serverless database. Is that right? Um, so we offer a, a bunch of products, um, of which one of them is CockroachDB serverless. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, like you would say with Lambda, it's not serverless itself, but it allows people to interact with it as if it were serverless. They don't have to. It's an abstraction. So in the case of CockroachDB serverless, it's exactly that. It's an abstraction. You don't have to worry about server provisioning. You don't have to worry about server hardening or scaling or networking or load balancing or any of those kind of things. Obviously, once you're in the database, that's that's where you you sit and that's what you care about as a developer. Yeah. When I looked, when I um, when I worked at Lush um, back in 2017 to 19, the team that I was in, I didn't want the team to be having to think about, for example, in the world of databases. I didn't want them to have to all become DBAs in order to speak to a database. Mm. Like, ultimately, we're a team of developers and we like to develop software. I, I consider developing SQL to be developing. Um, so, you know, we all want to just write code, create a great product and not have to worry about managing a complex database system under, under the hood. Right. And I think that's what a lot of these, these um, database services and serverless in itself provides. In the world of databases, there's... Obviously, in the background, it's full of servers. The servers, it's server full, um, but yeah, I, I, in in it, however you cut it, it's going to require a separation of compute and storage. Mm -hmm. You can't spin up a database, have a, an ephemeral data store, which as soon as your request is finished goes away. Obviously, that by definition, <laughs> that statelessness of a of a serverless request isn't stateful, and by definition, a database is very stateful. So, so I think that's that's an interesting part of the abstraction is the separation of the two. Um, yeah. That's what CockroachDB does, and uh, that's what Neon does in, in Mahmood's case. So you need to have somewhere to store the data, and then you can scale a completely, and you can scale the two. You can scale the storage in isolation, and you can scale the compute in complete isolation as well, which allows you to scale way more, perhaps, than you would be if you were operating on a piece of hardware, for example, and in the traditional vertical scaling sense. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and that's a that's an interesting topic that I think a lot of people, myself included, um, uh, don't fully understand when they first start looking into serverless databases. Is um, you know when you have persistent data, when you have long living data, um, how does it stick around, and how is it always available if your if it's running on serverless, which is ephemeral, it goes away. Um, can you talk a little bit more to how providers like CockroachDB and Neon actually solve this problem and what, yeah, what's actually going on under the hood? Of course, I, I, I wouldn't be able to speak confidently about Neon, um, mm -hmm. of course. I'd leave that to Mahmood. But from a CockroachDB perspective, uh, it runs in Kubernetes. We orchestrate it in Kubernetes, so we get the scaling from there. Um, you can launch your, your serverless cluster in GCP, AWS, it doesn't matter. But ultimately, you're deploying to an EKS or... Um, E EKS or what's the Amazon uh, E? One of the yeah yeah <laughs> ECS. E uh, no, that's I'm not sure. Container storage. <laughs> Let's assume that I've said the right thing. So you're deploying <laughs> to a Kubernetes, and we and we spin up SQL pods, which handle the the load from from uh, from tenants. It's a multi-tenant environment. On top of that, we have a proxy layer, which proxies requests to the right place. There's a load balancer on top, which is a global load balancer, which like makes sure that your request lands in the right region or the closest region, depending on your topology. Mm -hmm. And underneath, we have in a separate cluster, we have storage. So we can we can the storage stays. It's a persistent volume, a persistent volume claim at PVC. Uh, and on top of that, there's the the SQL pods. We can scale them down to zero um, mm -hmm. when you're, as Mahmood said, when you're not using it, you're not you're not paying for it. You it's it's consumption based cost. So we can actually remove all of us all of the sql pods for a tenant if they're not being used and we can do that because we have always warm pods ready to be substituted in if for example a traffic were to resume for that tenant so mm. so it's very flexible and it reduces the cost for both the the user of cockroach db and also for cockroach labs themselves right so that that sort of i mean that that hits sort of right on the head sort of what i wanted to talk about and and get to the point of is that um, so CockroachDB and other providers like this provide a serverless database, 
So that's more like a server's off serverless offering for the people who are actually using the product. But to actually build and deploy CockroachDB or Neon itself, um, you still have a persistent layer of data that doesn't go down, right? Yes. Yeah. In, in the world of a database, you, you your storage cannot be ephemeral. It needs to exist somewhere and um, be that um elastic block storage in the background or whatever whatever how it however it's implemented there always needs to be that storage because ultimately uh, cockroach db is backed by a monolithic key value store mm. um and interacted with via sql but there's still that data that doesn't go anywhere that data is is safe and it's replicated amongst multiple nodes be it multiple availability zones or multiple regions so ensure that you know, if the Kubernetes cluster were to go down or the, the Amazon region were to go down, your data is still safe in a, a different region so that when everything comes back up again, you can resume business as, as per. And, and obviously, if, you're, if the region you're operating in goes down, but there's another region that you're not operating in, but other people are, you know, they, they carry on working uh, business as usual. Right, right. Awesome. Yeah, no, it's cool to get that clarified and like actually said out loud on stream because this is one of those things where just surfing the community, you see people... Um, asking the question, like, how is this data persisted in a serverless setting? Yeah, um, and when you think of serverless, it's not immediately apparent. I yeah. think there's a lot of things which aren't immediately apparent when you're talking about serverless because you are a step removed from the metal. Mm. So things make, you know, it's it makes kind of... It's harder to visualize exactly what's happening because you are so far away from the, ex the execution of it, the infrastructure. Right, right, gotcha, yeah. Uh, so, so... Sort of following this this line of thought, then now that we sort of understand what a serverless database is um, and like sort of how it's composed, when when should a developer use a serverless database? Um, is there is it like a one size fits all? Just throw a serverless database in there, or are there certain times when maybe it's better to have a more traditional? Sure. Um, so I would say when cost is a driver is 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 one argument i think there are a bunch of arguments but cost is is a clear one because if your if your traffic is particularly spiky and you can't anticipate when your traffic spikes are going to occur if you're having a trough of traffic there's no little to no traffic you don't want to be incurring costs of a relatively idle piece of hardware or mm. provision dedicated hardware in the cloud so so from that perspective it's, it works really well if you need the elastic hands free scaling if you don't want to manage auto scaling groups or anything like that, you want to just throw traffic at it or don't throw traffic at it. You want it to know that it's elegantly going to scale and potentially even scale down to zero in the case of Cockroach and a lot of other, um, you know, in Lambda, you can scale back completely down to zero. Mm. So yeah, I'd say cost spikiness of traffic. If you don't want application orchestration to be your focus, it's another consideration. So, you know, if you if you don't want to have to go and get the the PhD in Kubernetes to orchestrate <laughs> to orchestrate your your scaling, and you want to f focus on on serverless, it's a different way of thinking. Obviously, I think you could view it as less complex, but I think every every which way you develop software is going to have its own complexities. If you're managing a monolith, there are complexities in that. If you're managing a microservice architecture, there are complexities in that. But I think yeah. there's also as someone who hasn't had much exposure to serverless, I think it's also quite complex in the way you manage serverless functions. It, you know, in a monolith, you've got one potential, potentially an executable that you can throw somewhere and have it run with the same, let's say there are a thousand functions in there. That's a thousand serverless functions that you've got to orchestrate somehow. And you've got to make sure that they're secure and you've got to make sure they're rooted. So I think there's a lot of, there's, there's trade-offs. But mm -hmm. in, the, in the case of a, a, a serverless database, I think the the reasons I've given are probably sensible as, yeah. a, as a reason you'd want to use them. Yeah, for sure. Um, are there any particular scenarios that you're that you can think of where you maybe would not want to use a serverless database? Is that mostly just if you have a team who you know you have that team of professionals who does know how to do that? Um, yeah, that that could be a, an argument. If you've got a team who are really pushing to have you know an in-house database or to have dedicated hardware for a database yes but on the flip side there might be um, a cost cutoff so if you're hitting let's say many many billions of requests a month and your traffic is very stable you know when, when your traffic is going to hit you might want to introduce your own also scaling mm. but it might be that serverless eventually becomes more expensive because the amount you're being charged although fairly negligible from a request basis a function by function call is actually outweighing the amount that a dedicated piece of hardware would cost you per month and simply the the egress um, yeah. 
and storage costs would would incur from that. Okay, yeah, I think that's an important thing uh, to to keep in mind because people tend to associate serverless with just it's cheaper because you only pay for what you what you use, which for most people is probably going to be the case. A lot of people are building smaller projects, even larger projects can be cheaper on serverless. But like you said, once you hit a certain amount of traffic where it's really steady, it's not as spiky as you'd expect with serverless. It um, you hit this point where it may make more sense to uh, cost wise to move to a more uh, customized, long running. Uh, yeah, potentially. And I think one thing to really bear in mind when you're adopting any new piece of technology, but especially serverless, is it's not the overhead in running it isn't free. Not I'm not talking about cost, but in terms of mind share. So you've got to you've got to think where is my my serverless function actually running. Mm. So there's you you can be bitten. For example, I've got um I think maybe Vercel serverless by default has one region which is Washington. And that's a that's a decision that the Vercel team and please correct me if I'm wrong if anyone's on the call from Vercel, but from what I understand is there's there's one decision being made that is um Washington is a good place to have pretty good coverage for for the free tier and I think maybe the pro plan as well. Let's say you've got your users are in the UK and your database is in Frankfurt, let's say, and you want to interact with the database from the States, from Washington via the serverless function. If you're and this could this isn't for just for sale, this could be anything. If you've deployed something by the default region in AWS, it's going to be e uh, US East One. Mm. My request from the user goes from the UK to the East Coast, back to the uh, to the database in Frankfurt, back to the serverless function on the East Coast, <laughs> and then back to my user in the UK. Um, a colleague of mine, Paul, put a, a beautiful demo together. If I can, I present. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll I'll share my screen, and let's have a look. So it's called Edge. Uh, let me know when you, I think you might be able to see it already, actually. Yes, good to so, bring it up. So this is, I've disabled animation because I, I don't know how it's going to look for, for everyone on the call. But essentially, that yellow pin there is me. It thinks I'm in Manchester, although I'm not. And this is using Vizel Serverless. So there's a serverless function in Washington. And the request is made, or Washington, DC, I should qualify. And my request hops over the pond to that serverless function. And the blue lines re uh, represent Cockroach DB and the replication that's happening there. We haven't introduced any kind of region pinning or anything like that in this database. We just wanted the, the lines to be very visible to everyone. Mm. And so it will make the hop. It might talk to this database if the, data, if the data needs to come from here. It might talk to this database if the data needs to come from here, which maybe in the case of a UK-based user, it might need to. So mm. there's a lot to think about. And potentially, a round trip might end up costing you in miles over 7,000 miles. So I think this is a really elegant way of, of showing yeah. what what to consider. And if I switch over to use AWS Lambda, then we might hit a cold start. So I think, yeah, 1.8 seconds, we've hit a cold start in that case. So 0 .2, 280 milliseconds. So in this case, we're using a Lambda that's been deployed closer to the user so that they make a very small hop to Frankfurt, and then it can talk to the database there. So obviously, that wouldn't get you out of the situation of if you still need to make the hop to the the US but that becomes a that becomes a database problem that becomes a something that i as someone who uses a database can figure out it's mm -hmm. not but i think that the key message to get to get across i hope i can communicate is be very mindful about where you place your serverless functions they're not free they do incur you can't beat the speed of light yeah no and that's a that's another really good thing to remember because um as people on the stream may have seen at Prisma, we recently did a series of like performance optimizations with Prisma. And one of the things that we, we didn't actually like build anything to fix this, but one of the like hard realizations we found was that the where you place your serverless function is really important to how fast you can interact with your database. Because as you just saw, that UI is a really great way to see that you may have a hop overseas, which already isn't super great. But depending on where your database is, you may need to hop back overseas and then get the data back. And the, the whole request ends up becoming like twice as long as it needs to be. Um, so this is where the power I think comes in with these serverless databases, where it allows you to sort of get your data closer to your serverless functions and you know more globally uh, spread it out. So this is, uh, it's cool to see a visualization like that. Um, what, what was the link to that actually? I want to post yeah, that in the chat. I'll paste it. Yeah, of course. Um, let me just find the chat. 
Oh, I can't put in the comments, but I'll, I'll send it in private chat. And if you could okay. echo that through, that'd be great. Yeah, great. I think this is a, just a really good resource for anybody who wants to uh, understand how like these performance optimizations work. This is just a good way to actually visualize it. I know I'm a visual learner, so that helps a lot. So <laughs> if you're if you're interested in, in like poking around at this, uh, the link's up on the screen. And this uh, is right the first now. of many demos as well. Uh, it's not the only demo we've got, but I think it's it's interesting to it's not only educating us as 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 practitioners of serverless as well hopefully that you, you know as people are saying in the comments this, they, i really appreciate it this is fancy really neat it's, it's great to see because i didn't appreciate how bad it could be until i saw it and i think the <laughs> same as you i i yeah. i like as soon as i can see something i can see how bad it is <laughs> right yeah it's like you, you can understand the comps concepts all you want but once you actually see it like even seeing it in action from a technical standpoint, seeing an application set up and looking at the numbers, you still don't fully appreciate what's going on until you see the global view of it. And I think that's that was a really good initiative on your guys' part to put together that uh, that little demo there. <laughs> and uh, that's that, and that's one facet. Like where it runs is is definitely one consideration. But also your tolerance on things like cold starts. They're not. Uh, Amazon will say that you know if you've got a fairly busy application you'll never see a cold start and and i've i've been keeping this thing warm in the background because i didn't want people to have to wait for a while to to, to for for the demo mm. um, and i and i still got a cold start so in the background i've been pinging it every now and again just to make sure it doesn't stay cold uh, <laughs> right. so it doesn't go cold obviously there are different things i can do there's provision concurrency in aws lambda which i'm sure is probably surfaced um among the packages that you can get mm -hmm. um get a package by but another thing to think about, um, and and the language in which you write your lambdas as well. I'd imagine the majority of people on the call, maybe if it's unfair to say, but would maybe be writing them in JavaScript um, because you'd prim Prisma being a, a tool for writing mm -hmm. um, TypeScript and things like that. It, it probably JavaScript, but it's not the only language. If you're using something like Java or .NET, that comes with a framework. And and what I didn't appreciate until recently was serverless functions. Have, are a three-step process. The, the framework is downloaded, the framework is initialized, and then the function's executed. And if you've got a cold start, that's exactly what's happening. You're having to go through these three processes. So if you're using provision, provision concurrency or warm, warm functions, I guess you could probably call it, you're skipping the first two. And without having to download uh, an entire Java or .NET framework in order to run the function. So I think there's, there's a lot of trade-offs in languages and and actually you can get a graphical visualization of how badly a cold of a cold start can affect the performance of your application depending on the programming language you use mm. um j just because you mentioned the term and i think it's a really important one do you mind giving like a quick definition of what provision concurrency is like what it actually does to keep your, your process warm yeah no, thank you for keeping me on track yeah that, that was wrong for me to assume so provision <laughs> concurrency essentially it's a pool of warm functions. So if I set my provisioned concurrency to five, I will have five warm functions ready to go where the language or the framework has already been downloaded and initialized. And essentially they've skipped those two initialization steps and the function is just ready to go. Um, I don't know what the, I don't think there is a default in provisioned um, concurrency in AWS Lambda. Uh, you do pay slightly more for it. I think it's fairly negligible still. Mm. Um, but if you're if you cannot tolerate cold starts, provisioned concurrency is definitely an option for you. There's also ways of keeping it warm through various warmers. I know the serverless framework offers yeah. warmers, so you can do it like that as well. Um, that add I found that added a bit of complexity to it. Um, maybe simply because you know I'm new to serverless, uh, relatively speaking. Um, so having something that I can just rely on to keep something warm for me is great because I know that when my first users in the morning over a period of idleness touch touch base with the application, they're not going to suffer hideous delays. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think uh, provision concurrency is really cool because at, at Prisma, we've looked a lot into what goes into a cold start. We did a big blog post on it recently. And those steps of downloading your code, downloading your framework, initializing it, um, having it, um, uh, I forget the term now, but having the runtime be able to understand the code and actually parse it out into what needs to be run on the machine, that part takes a long time. And that's where uh, this comes into play. I think one of, the, one of the drawbacks, and you kind of touched on it, is that once you employ provisioned concurrency, you're essentially paying at this point not for 
at least for like whatever you set up, say you set five, you're paying for five long running instances. So at that point, it's serverless, but you're taking away sort of the benefit of the pay as you go. Um, yeah, it's not quite. It's all a trade off. I, I yeah. would I wouldn't say that any technology is a silver bullet. I mm -hmm. think that there are trade offs with everything. And, and the trade-off with, with Lambda, without provisional, oh, I say Lambda, serverless, sorry, I use the two interchangeably sometimes, <laughs> yeah. is you're going to get cold starts because, unless you code against them, because that's the nature of it. Something has to be spun up from nothing in some instances to service your request. If there's nothing there, there you have to you have to spin it up. It's not free. Mm. So having something always warm, you know, a request comes, maybe the first person takes the hit of of the, the cold start but that function at that point is then warm so yeah it's it's a trade-off if you want to pay a little bit more to, to have provisioned it's that's the trade-off you make you've favored spending a little bit more to get a slightly lower um request time for your initial user or initial users i think every five or 15 minutes which is when the serverless functions typically go cold mm -hmm. right yeah yeah very cool um, I, I think uh, for this section of the event, I think we're running up a bit on time, uh, but I think this gives us a lot of more things to talk about on the panel. Um, a lot of these concepts that we've talked about are things that are not quite difficult to understand at first, but they're often misunderstood. So if anyone in the, uh, in the audience has questions about this and you want like, um, if there's something we talked about that you want a deeper understanding of, uh, please ask the questions in the chat. Um, we'll have questions on the panel, uh, but we would like to tackle your questions as well as we go through it. So yeah, please, uh, please do that. Uh, but for now, I think I'm going to transition over. I'm going to bring everyone on stage and then we'll have a chat, but thanks so much for this part, Rob. That was, that was, uh, very insightful. A lot of great stuff. Thank you. All right, full screen. This is awesome. Nice. Um, we, we have a new face on here. Uh, this is Tyler from uh, our Prisma development team. Tyler, do you want to introduce yourself a bit before we get going? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Tyler Benfield. I'm one of the tech leads on the Prisma data platform. Um, my focus is on new products and features. And if you've been following Prisma, you'll see um, we have a couple of products in early access right now. Um, so one of them is Accelerate. It's a managed, globally distributed cache for your Prisma operations. Um, along with the serverless connection pool. So it kind of ties into a lot of what we've been talking about today. Um, and Pulse is a way to write application code that reacts to your database changes in real time. Um, and I'm really excited to be part of the panel today. Uh, we at Prisma are both building on serverless and building for serverless. Um, so I'm really excited about this space. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think uh, while we wait for questions to come in, I've got a couple of starter things similar to what we've done in past episodes. Um, I'd like to ask just general to all three of you, uh, what excites you most in the serverless data landscape right now? What what new upcoming things have you uh, excited for the direction things are going? Uh, and I think maybe maybe we can start with you, Tyler, since you're, you're yeah. new up on the screen. Yeah, I'm really excited about the community and tooling that's being developed right now. Um, I think, you know, compute, uh, serverless compute has been around for, for quite a while now, and it's kind of hitting a more maturity stage. Um, we're seeing a lot more things move to the edge. A lot of better developer experience coming out of that. Um, just lots of, of evolution has happened there. Um, data is kind of falling behind on that and has to catch up. And I think we're now seeing a lot of database tools like Cockroach and Neon and others that are beginning to sort of address the needs that arose from moving the compute into serverless. Mm. Yeah, for sure. for sure. All right, Mahmood, what about you? What do you think? Yeah, honestly, I don't know. To me, what's super exciting is how a lot of companies are trying to now innovate because like the, the I'd say something like AWS Lambda is now, like, like Tyler said, it's been around for a while. So it's kind of like a solid primitive to build on top of. And now a lot of companies understand that there's a, like, there's a good opportunity for you to build a service that makes developers' lives easier so that they can work faster. They don't have to worry about managing and scaling infrastructure. It just works. And it's not easy to build like something that is super seamless. It takes a lot of work, trial and error, but it's kind of obvious that this is the direction that the developer tool kind of like ecosystem is moving towards. It's like, how can we make this 
as easy, as fast as possible? How can we make sure that maybe all the trade-offs are well understood? Uh, how can we make it clear that you know this tool is the right tool for the job? Um, and kind of make sure that, I don't know, like you don't run into any kind of surprises. Like for example, the cold start that Rob mentioned, um, for example, in Neon, because we do also have uh, the architecture of separating storage and compute, we have the cold start kind of like, you know, like it's it's kind of the trade-offs when you scale down to zero. And this kind of throws some people off where they're like, oh, wait, why, why is this like, you know, why is there some kind of uh, cold start period or like, you know, a period until the database is actually active and ready um, to receive queries? And it's like, well, this is the trade-off. So that's kind of like we're always kind of trying to make sure like, okay, there's benefits for from serverless and being able to achieve a pay for a used model, but then we have the cold start. So we're actively now working on it to make sure it's kind of like as low as possible to kind of combat that. So to me, that's what's very exciting is like, you know, we kind of understand all of the different benefits and trade-offs of different paradigms. And we're trying to like make sure and like kind of like bend it so that developers kind of get the best possible experience. So yeah, I don't know, it's exciting. Yeah, and I, I would just quickly like to emphasize the, the phrase that you used, as low as possible uh, for the cold starts. I think that's important for people to understand is that when you are working with serverless, it's not gonna be zero unless you're doing something like provision yeah. concurrency as we talked about, which incurs an extra cost. Um, these serverless providers try to keep this as low as possible, but there is still, when you're using serverless, that trade-off. And that's where you need to make the technical decision for your application and your team. Do I want to go serverless or do I want to have a traditional serverful database? Yeah, absolutely. Like that's kind of also one of the reasons why we make it possible to not scale down to zero if you want. You can make it just so that uh, you have a very, very tiny compute running. Uh, this way it's kind of the balance between, okay, I won't have a cold start, but there will be kind of a, a base fee that you will need to pay mm -hmm. because it's running 24 seven. And yeah, so that's like, that's kind of like all, like we're offering both of these options because we know that, you know, like sometimes um, different use cases require different setups. And, you know, like that's also part of the things that's exciting is like these constraints where you get people asking like, oh, this is like, I don't wanna, I don't want this behavior. It's like, okay, fine. We'll, we'll figure it out to make sure <laughs> you have this behavior. Um, but yeah, so that's yeah. what's exciting. Yeah, cool. Uh, Rob, we'll move to you just to reiterate the question. What what is it that excites you right now in serverless data space? Sure. Um, so I I do have one of my own, but I'd like to touch on Mahmoud's point as well um, about it, it kind of it lowers the barrier to entry for people. I can spin up something. I can provide functionality to the users of my application wherever they are in the world without having to think oh, I need a, a server over there. I need a server over there. I just I just deploy stuff and it happens. So I think from that perspective, it's super powerful because it brings people into the application development world without them having to, to you know, go through all of the, this is how I deploy Linux onto a, or Ubuntu server onto a, onto bare metal. This is how, you know, there's, development is hard enough. You know, I'm, I'm writing a front end application at the moment and it's just, I've never had to use a JavaScript framework before, and th that's an, that's an, in enough of itself is is a big thing without having to to create a machine at the same time. Mm. But the th I think the thing that really excites me about serverless in the world of data is the fact that it's a topic of conversation now. The fact that we are talking about data in a serverless context is the thing that I'm finding most exciting at the moment. I uh, it's. We're, we're not only providing functionality to users wherever they are in the world, we're also providing data to back their applications wherever they are in the world. I think that's hugely powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that sort of touches on what Tyler said is that like uh, we, we have all of these resources and developer tooling for working on serverless, but data has fallen behind for a while. Um, and we're catching up, but we're not quite there yet. And that sort of really nicely leads into what I wanted to get to next is what do you guys see as... Um, like what the major challenges working with serverless data right now, specifically geared towards like the data piece of serverless. Um, and I think we'll just keep going around. So Tyler, why don't you start us? Yeah, I think one of those challenges, and Rob, I think you touched on this, is just the geographic distribution as you start moving your application more to the edge. Um, that's not necessarily required for serverless, but it's commonly you know associated with serverless. Um, you can't fix the speed of light. So I think there's this interesting <laughs> like sort of balance of, do I want consistency in my data? or with better latency, 
or do I want to take a latency hit to make sure all of my writes are consistent with my reads? Um, so I think that's, that's a really interesting challenge. Uh, and I've seen like a lot of uh, tools pop up in this space. Um, Accelerate kind of tries to fix that from one angle. Um, and also scaling to zero. We've already touched on that before. But scaling something uh, data related to zero is, is not trivial. I, I don't think uh, scaling compute is either. But I feel like data is a special kind of challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mahmoud, what do you think? What are, what are some of the biggest challenges right now you see from, from your perspective in this space? Yeah, definitely like the idea of replicating data and kind of like I think it will it's kind of like the benefits that I, t I spoke about where it's like, oh, you pay for EUs, everything automatically scales. The different challenges now are related to geographical regions, caching, uh, and kind of how do you make sure that things are super fast and snappy? Because now like, you know, with the edge, you can have a serverless function running in kind of close to the user and the request is served just from the closest data center to where the request is coming from. So that's great. But with data, it's like, it gets a lot trickier. Um, and caching, for example, is a, is a smart idea. If you know, let's say you have the same data uh, that is being requested frequently and it's not changing a lot, then it makes sense. You have a distributed cache. Everyone now gets a super snappy experience. But it's not, again, a one size fits all. And like it depends on the use case and what you're building. So I don't know. I feel like the more, like over time, what will happen is all of the kind of um, database providers that are adopting the serverless model will think really hard, study what their users are asking for and what they're building, and will try to come up with these different solutions that kind of work uh, to solve their needs. Like, I don't know, for example, read replicas is something we're actively working on mm. to make sure that you can have uh, just different kind of well, replicas so that the data, like reads are faster this way. Um, and then maybe, you know, like collaborating with maybe like Prisma and Accelerate to make sure like, okay, this should be like a very easy to set up experience and you don't have to worry about uh, maybe like setting up your own cache. So yeah, I think it's like the biggest challenge is just figuring out the different use cases because now everyone wants to build global applications that are highly available and we want to do it in a way where we don't have to think about infrastructure. Everything scales and they can handle everything. But it's, I don't know, it's not trivial, but it's, it's definitely, yeah, like these are, I think, the challenge is just figuring out the different use cases and how to build solutions that address them. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's great to see the, the, like the positive uh, direction that these database providers are taking, though. Like Tyler said, we've been falling behind um, just because of the yeah. nature of how quickly people moved to serverless, but uh, we can see that everything's moving forward already, like with Neon and Cockroach, there's big advancements. I feel like there's new exciting stuff coming out all the time. Um, so it'll be cool to see once we get there, what the developer experience is gonna look like for, um, as you were just talking about Mahmood, not having to think about this stuff. <laughs> like, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, Rob, how about you? So I've been anchored again. When you initially asked the question, I had a completely different kind of train of thought. So <laughs> I'll, I'm going to visit Tyler and Mahmood's point first, mm -hmm. because I, I'd, I'd like to cover it from Cockroach's standpoint as well. Um, so in terms of technological challenge of where you place your data, the way Cockroach Labs have solved the problem is to give you different types of table topologies. So if I want vast reads from wherever I am in the world, there's a topology for that at the, at the expense of slower writes, because data has to be replicated globally. But from a write perspective, it's quick. If you want fast reads and writes from your local region, there's a topology for that. Your data wouldn't, in the case of the Edge demo that I showed, data wouldn't leave the Frankfurt, or, or rather, it wouldn't leave the European zone, for mm. example, if you've configured it that way. So I think there's, but it's a hugely complex, it's a hugely complex thing. And when you asked the question, I, I completely saw it from a, a different perspective as well. I see it as a, as a challenge for people in the database serverless space. So I saw it as maybe a challenge being enterprise adoption. So I think, I don't think it wouldn't be fair to say that enterprise is lagging behind in this area because obviously every enterprise is different. But mm. from the enterprises I've spoken to prior to my time at Cockroach Labs and my experience is my experiences within enterprise, I've noticed that a lot of companies still have on-prem data centers. A lot of people, a lot of companies still work in an active, passive, you know, primary product or production disaster recovery mode and and for people companies like that the the idea of migrating to serverless is probably quite a strange one i think those companies are more likely to to enter the world of kubernetes and orchestration 
long before they consider taking everything completely serverless. So I think that might be a that might be a challenge that all of us will face is in in terms of op adoption of our technologies. Absolutely, yeah, no, and that's a great point to make. T taking it more from like the adoption side, um, I, I know I've worked at companies in the past who they make great technological decisions, they do a lot of cool things, but adopting brand new technology is really scary because you know you don't want to foot on yourself and a couple months down the road realize oh this wasn't the right direction to go especially um, if it's not your main area of expertise if you've got yeah. some people you know if you've got a team within your enterprise that are really strong in orchestrating servers onto bare metal the idea of transitioning to service serverless takes away their edge mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be a pardon the pun it's, you know, <laughs> it's it's a big i think it's a big ask for people to shift their mindset and i think it's up to companies like ours to, ed to help educate the enterprises and to make the whole world of serverless a lot more appetizing for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Because there, there's so much like previous research and experience and just, uh, you know, just so many resources out there for, um, I don't want to say older models, but the traditional models that a lot of enterprises use right now, switching to something new, you, you, you're expected to become an expert and your enterprise that you're working for is going to expect things to work. So it's how do you, how do you get that transition to be as smooth as possible? Um, what are what would you guys say are some of the main things that might hold someone back from adopting serverless database in their enterprise? I know you touched on a couple of things, Rob, but maybe Mahmoud and Tyler, what do you what do you think are some of these things that make it scary for an enterprise to move forward with this? Yeah, I think it, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, I think in past places I've worked uh, that ha had concerns about. Uh, maybe the distribution of the compute and data and just all the components of the infrastructure, right? Like it's kind of feels good to have everything in one place, like in you know one provider, everything's connected in a VPC and it, you know, it all feels kind of tight and controlled. But I think the world is moving away from that. That came with the cost of that complexity. And when we start looking at, at services that are very focused on solving a problem really, really well, and we might have to give up some of that control to, to get that. Um, I think that's the challenge that enterprises will have to get more comfortable with is, is maybe giving up some of that control to take advantage of things that feel like just auto tuning, right? And it, everything just works rather than having to manage it yourself. And yeah, it, it comes down to a balance of the control versus the, the management. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I know, uh, I, I, I sympathize with what you're saying there, because like, uh, past companies I've worked at, we've had, we've had everything I've worked at places where we have stuff on premise, even, or just all in AWS. Uh, everything managed there, long running. And it is a comforting feeling to know that you know exactly where everything's running, what's going on, how you scale it. If you need to change it, you can go change the configuration and it, you, you just know what's going on. Um, when I was first jumping into serverless, it was kind of scary going, I don't know where everything's running at. I just know I'm using this service and this service and this service and it works good. So it, uh, I think that's a huge one there. Uh, Mahmoud, what, what do you think? Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. It's like this is also the like serverless's strength and weakness. It's like saying you don't have to think about anything, and then people are like, "Oh, but I want to think about this thing, and <laughs> I actually want to have you know visibility and more control." So that's kind of like the I, I think that will always be a challenge. Like you want to provide users, you know, with a serverless offering. It's like, hey, it just works. You don't have to think about stuff. But then you know you have this other type of audience that's like, no, we need visibility into everything. We mm. want to make sure that if any tiny thing that can be optimized or something that we can kind of uh, look into, we want that. Now, I think it, it is possible. Uh, it's just kind of, it is a challenge uh, when it comes to when you're building a product, figuring out how can you also address the needs for people who actually want this visibility. But it, it kind of, you know, that like the challenge is always like prioritization. Like, do you build a product where people really have, you know, don't need to think about anything at all? That's kind of a direction. The other direction is like, okay, how do we keep the same level of experience, but also allowing you to, you know, kind of, I don't know, if it's like if it's a car, you can open the car hood and look into, okay, what's happening and you understand <laughs> it. But it's just, it's like, they're completely separate kind of like philosophies when you're building a product. So I think that's kind of uh, the challenge. Like, I don't know, I feel like a lot of problems we kind of know how to solve them, but it's kind of like there are always trade-offs. Like we can basically, when building a product, be like, okay, we offer this, 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 and that. <laughs> this has this is trade-offs. This has trade-offs. This has trade-offs, and you get to pick and choose. And I don't know. From my, like in my opinion, the the challenge is how do you build a great experience where you can 
make all of this possible mm -hmm. and you know supporting it maintaining it making everything work so i don't know for me when you asked the question about the challenge i was it wasn't in my mind from a an adoption perspective it was really just about like how you build this thing and kind of you know live to that promise where you have a delightful experience so people actually enjoy it because if you have something that automatically scales and it's not really uh kind of delightful to use but some users are like hey it's just not worth it like i already yeah. know how to have my own database it's okay if i'm over provisioning a little bit it's not the end of the world but i don't want to go through like this big learning curve where i have to learn something new but yeah, yeah. that's kind of what i had in mind and i, I, I think that Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Tyler. I said another factor there is maybe uh, it comes to mind is like responsibility, right? Like one thing I love about building on serverless is I get to sort of delegate responsibility to someone else. Um, I can focus yeah. on my application code. And yeah, it felt good to like maybe provision a, a database in my infrastructure. And I have a lot of control over that. But I also have a lot of responsibility to make sure it stays up and running and performant. And yeah, I think giving that responsibility over to someone else might be scary at first. But I also trust that Many of these vendors um, have a team dedicated to making sure these things are up and running and healthy and performant. Um, and I might be a small shop uh, you know, focused on my application where I should be focused on, on uh, product features. Um, yeah, so responsibility. Yeah, I think that's sort of what, what I was going to comment on is that, um, like, like you said, Mahmoud, sometimes people may think, oh, maybe I'm over provisioning a little bit, but doesn't matter. It, that's a hard thing to think about from our perspective because we're in the tech community every day thinking about the best improvements, best improvements, yeah. you know, how can we get this to work the best, the fastest, globally spread. Uh, but a lot of times that's not the case within an enterprise or even, you know, a, a mid-sized business is that they want something that works. They want something that they can manage and that they know how it works. If something maybe costs a little bit more, if it's maybe um, you're spending a little bit too much resources on it, that can often be, a, oh, that's fine. At least we know it's working. Um, so it's it's a mindset that, especially like in my field, developer advocacy, and you, Mahmoud, and Rob, and Tyler, you two just working on these products. It's like a mindset that's kind of hard to get in sometimes because of how ingrained we are in this world. But it is an important one, I think, to, to consider. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I think that the, the responsibility is a nail on the head moment, I think, because like, like you say, enterprises, can swallow the, the cost and the responsibility of it because they've got a dedicated team of it that you know the cost of managing uh, some physical infrastructure is negligible compared to the cost of running a, a, a massive enterprise so i think enterprises like that are always going to be tough to, to to break into because they are their needs are different their appetites are different their costs and performance and management metrics are all different so, so I think it's. I think it does come down to responsibility. What the, the company want to be responsible for? Do they do they have a, an on call support team who are ready to nurse a physical piece of infrastructure back to health mm. should it become unhealthy? It's. It, I think it depends on every single business. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. Yeah, like yeah. The way, when I think about it, I kind of ask myself like, oh, like will everything just now become serverless? Like. And, you know, over time, when you look at, like, I think when serverless came out, everyone's like, oh, yeah, this is the future. Everyone will be using serverless. But then over time, you understand, like, different paradigms can coexist. And it's like nothing really just solves everything. Like, I don't know. I, I like to imagine, you know, a world where everything just works. You don't have to think about servers. Everything just magically works and all use cases are covered. But I kind of also feel like it probably won't be like that. But I feel like what will happen is, over time, um, you will have the tr like you like developers will be very lucky and very fortunate to have just you know kind of like they can go shopping and pick the best and you know most optimized solution for their use case, and they can kind of build the best possible experience for their end users and kind of like database providers can make that possible. So, yeah. Yeah, I think like, I think that sort of plays into the idea that we've talked about a couple times throughout the series is. Uh, the, the concept of a self-provisioning architecture where maybe there are different architectures like serverless architecture and more traditional. Um, none of them are a silver bullet, but they do make sense mm -hmm. in certain scenarios. Um, I think the, the community is trending towards and actively pushing towards um, having the ability to just write your code, deploy it, and it's sort of the providers that you deploy your code to can decide how do you best you know, deploy this to work for your needs. Um, that's something I think that a lot of 
technologies are moving towards. Um, they're making a lot of headway there, but it's still very much a work in progress. But that's sort of what I hope to see in the future. So that that gives us the ability to, um, again, not have to think about how these things are being deployed, but you can still get the best of both worlds um, in how the applications are deployed. Yeah. And I love that philosophy from a future proofing perspective too. Like when I used to to manage servers and, and databases and that sort of thing, there was always updates to apply and they always broke things. And <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you would have the, these weird issues that would take days, you know, sometimes to, to troubleshoot and iron out and, and just do these like routine maintenance operations. But that idea of uh, a self-provisioning runtime is I, I write my code, I, I focus on my business logic. I you know, let someone else handle the deployment and orchestration of everything. And as those operations, those maintenance operations don't necessarily go away, but they're not my problem anymore. I'm, again, responsibility. I've just delegated that to someone else. And I, I'm, maybe I had to pay a premium for it, but that's okay because I got my time back to go focus on other things. Um, I think and that's a also, really You spent more money, but you've also saved probably heaps of money in terms of yeah. like maybe your your OPEX is going to be slightly higher from the running of the application perspective, but in terms of developing the application and maintaining it, it's, it's a huge, huge saving. Mm. Yeah. I feel like that's often overlooked is that that developer cost and time that goes into the, those operations that we can you know, essentially outsource to one of the, the vendors that would host these things for us. Yeah. And that, that's a good perspective to have on it is that idea of outsourcing. It's like when you, when you use one of these serverless offerings, one of these providers, you're basically, you're kind of like hiring a little team to, to manage this thing for you. This is now your on-call support 24 seven. If it goes down, they'll fix it. Um, and that, that's a powerful thing when you think about it from that perspective. Yeah. Um, it looks like we're coming up uh, a little bit past time actually. So thank you so much guys for the great conversation. Um, if anybody has questions in the chat, feel free to keep posting them. I'll come back and we'll, we'll try to get it answered somewhere for you. Um, but thank you for the participation we did have. That was great. Um, before we sign off, does anyone here have any parting words that you'd like to share? Uh, anything at all? Parting words. <laughs> uh, it makes I, it sound so dark. <laughs> I, uh, it's like, I don't know. I mean, it's honestly very cool. Um, I'm honestly like glad that this series exists. Kind of, it gives a space where, you know, like you can have different people talk about different topics that, are under so and like I said, there's just so many things to talk about really, depending on which thing you're focusing on. Like, you know, if like serverless databases, well, you have different kinds of databases. Each one has its own like trade-offs and benefits. And if it's like just the compute story, well, yeah. So honestly, I'm just glad to be here. And thank you so much for organizing this event and having us on here for us to kind of just, you know, talk a little bit about this broad topic. Uh, where, you know, you have people kind of overusing the term a little bit. Mm -hmm. I got to just like, oh, yeah, it's serverless. And just you slap a sticker on it. And it's like, this bad boy is now serverless. And yeah, yeah. but yeah, it's it's nice uh, that we have this kind of opportunity. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. This is this is great. It's nice to bring these minds together to, to sort of come to a consensus on some of these ideas and concepts. Um, if I may, my, my parting words will be twofold. One will be obviously massive gratitude. Thank you for having uh, myself and Mahmood here. It's been awesome. Um, and also some words of encouragement, I think, to anyone who's not currently in the serverless space or using serverless technologies via databases, et cetera, in the case of Cockroach and Neon, give it a go. Um, we've, we've both got free tiers. And and I think they're they're both a really interesting place to kick the tires, see how you feel about using them, see what they can do, see what opportunities they open up for you, because I, I, being able to spin up a, a six region global cluster in under thirty seconds is you know is game changing. So like play with it, see what you can do with it, see kind of what worlds it opens up to you, see what customer bases it opens up to you. Just have a play, and, and I think all of us would be grateful for your feedback. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, don't, I can't imagine myself spinning up clusters myself and managing them. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not something I, I don't think I will do. And probably the next 10 years, like, I wouldn't, like, if you assign me up for it, I'm like, yeah, no, you know, let, <laughs> let someone else take care of it. So, yeah, definitely. Well, when I, say server, I mean, serverless clusters. Yeah. I, I don't mean actual physical clusters. That would be a <laughs> I mean, thing. Yeah. Even like, yeah, even if, like, you know, like, I'm this, like, I can't even imagine, like, I'm, I would say I kind of imagine myself as the ideal user for the service kind of like for the company i'm working for like i'm not really 
uh, interested in managing my own database, scaling it, making sure it's always up, um, you know, or running all sorts of maintenance operations on it. So yeah, definitely give it a go. Give us feedback, try it out, and you know, share your kind of like feedback concerns. We'd we'd happy uh, to chat. But yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining. Um, this was this was a really great session. Uh, a lot of a lot of cool insights. Um, and I think I'll I think I'll sign us off now. But yeah, have a great day, everybody. Take care. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.